Hi, and welcome to today's Engaging for Missouri webinar. I'm Alice Roach from the Division of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Missouri, and I will be your host today. With each of these 30-minute webinars, we intend to share research-based insights that leaders like you can apply in your own work to benefit and strengthen the state's agriculture and food system, hospitality sector, and communities. Today, Dr. Mary Hendrickson will share observations from her recent Fulbright Scholar Program trip to Iceland. Before I invite her to begin, I want to share a few housekeeping notes. First, we'll close the webinar today with a question and answer session. Those of you who connected to today's webinar via your computer can submit your comments in the chat screen. So to open the chat screen, just click the chat button that you see at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you join today by phone, then you can email me your questions at roacham.missouri.edu. Second, all attendees are muted and may not start their video. Third, if you encounter any technical problems during the webinar today, then please let me know by either submitting a comment in the chat screen, or you can also send me an email at roacham at missouri.edu, and I'll do my best to help you troubleshoot. Fourth, we will make a webinar recording available to you sometime tomorrow, so you can look for an email from Zoom that shares more about where you can access that recording. Additionally, you can access an archive of all of our previous Engaging for Missouri webinars on our division's YouTube channel. So now we'll transition to the topic of today's webinar, which is titled Adapting to Thrive, What We Can Learn from Icelandic Farms. Presenting is Dr. Mary Hendrickson, who is an Associate Professor of Rural Sociology and a 2019-2020 Fulbright U.S. Scholar Grant recipient who traveled to Iceland. So thank you, Mary, for presenting today. If you could please unmute your microphone and start your video, then we can begin today's presentation. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks, Alice. Thanks um, for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about things I learned living in Iceland for the past six months. First of all, everybody should uh, go to um, Iceland. It's a beautiful country. Um, I'm trying to get my slides to advance, Alice, and uh, they're not going. It's a beautiful country. Um, it's uh, wonderful. There's all kinds of uh, um, things to see in Iceland, but it is also a uh, um, also a, uh, a country that has a lot of um, challenges. And so let me see if I can get this to advance. There we go. So beautiful, um, clear water, uh, animal views, Glacial melt everywhere you go, glacial rivers, um, uh, rivers flowing out of lava, powerful waterfalls, which will become important as you will see. But it's also about um, um, uncertainty. There is, it's a volcanic island. Um, there's always ongoing volcanic activity. Um, this is lava from a, a previous um, uh, volcano uh, from years ago. So Iceland, cool climate with short growing season. Um, climate change is a really um, important topic. Um, it's sensitive because it's so near the Arctic Circle um, that uh, changes can really impact it. They're hopeful that some of them might be helpful for them, but, but that remains to be seen. It's a very sparsely populated place with 364,000 people in the entire country. And of course, there's a, um, it's about 800 miles around the Ring Road, but it's really hard to cross across Iceland, you'll see in a minute. Two thirds of the people live in the capital region um, and rural areas are depopulating. Um, food's pretty expensive because they bring it all um, imported. Uh, a lot of food is imported, not all of it, and I will talk about that. Um, and dairy and sheep grazing livestock production actually predominates. Fishing is really still a very important industry. Um, it's uh, um, sustainably managed industry because of the overfishing problems they've had in the past. So um, I, very isolated, as you can see, Iceland's way up there in the North Atlantic. Um, the northernmost point is three miles away from the Arctic Circle, so very influenced by the Arctic climate, yet it's an island, so it's mediated, so it's very temperate as well. The issue for Iceland is, is that there's not a whole lot of land area. There's some incredible soils, volcanic soils in the fjords and the rivers that you can kind of see here, but there are, um, it's, it's not a lot, and there's a lot of rocks in interior. There's, a, there's several big glaciers. Um, about 6% of the area is actually uh, cultivated. 
So that cool climate, this is late May in Eastern Iceland. Um, and you can see there's just starting, um, there's a little bit of barley that's up here in the middle. They're planting some barley over here and they've also got some um, uh, uh, vegetable crops under cover. Um, this is an older organic farm at the, um, on the east side. Um, it's been in operation as an organic farm since the 80s. But they've had on-farm barley crop failures of uh, different times, for about every four years. They have had some government support for those crop failures, but uh, they're not sure if they're gonna get that in the future. So you can kind of see they're trying to do things. They have an on-farm cafe and shop. They use the trees that they're growing um, it, um, on their farm um, to build the, the shop. But it, this kind of encapsulates some of the challenges that Icelandic farmers do have. However, Iceland has this really wonderful um, motto, and it's called, um, um, I'm going to not pronounce this very well, I haven't uh, learned a lot of Icelandic, but it's Theta uh, it's the country's motto. It's really translated roughly to, it's gonna work out. It'll work out somehow. Um, so what that allows them to do is adapt. Um, adapt, constant adaptation is just a factor of Icelandic society. So one thing that's really interesting is they've, um, they have a lot of geothermal activity. So they have a lot of geothermal heating. This is actually the, one of the most powerful hot springs in Europe. I'm not gonna pronounce it because I really murder the pronunciation, but it was about 30, um, minutes away from where we lived, our, all our hot water came from this. And of course, this is the kind of thing that allows Icelanders to have outdoor swimming pools open year round with this geothermal heated water. And then this is important for greenhouses as we'll see in just a second, um, but they also use a lot of hydropower that also provides a lot, lot of their electricity. So between geothermal and hydropower, they're very green sources of electricity in, um, or of power in Iceland. So this is the way they capitalize on um, the, This picture was actually taken in late January. This is um, the Agricultural University's uh, um, uh, location in Reykjavik, which is a very uh, geothermal active region. But you can see that they've built a lot of greenhouses while they have um, a lot of good geothermal heating. They also have problems because of light, right? Because they have midnight sun right now, but then they have a lot of dark in, in the winter. However, they're very successful at growing a lot of these crops. They have um, even have um, coffee and bananas in these agriculture university greenhouses to show that it's possible and um, it won't totally break you to to have a greenhouse um, icelandic production they're self-sufficient in cucumbers this they're three miles you know away from the arctic circle now granted where this production is happening it's a little bit further down but really it's it's you know close to the arctic self-sufficient in cucumbers Cucumbers, Icelandic cucumbers are available year round. 60% of tomatoes um, are produced there, 30% of their peppers, about a quarter of their herbs. They use things like um, volcanic soil media uh, to uh, um, also enhance their production. What I'm showing is they're capitalizing on the resources that they do have. Now, one of the policies that they have just come out with is that they're um, hoping that uh, these greenhouse uh, producers and other producers will increase domestic vegetable production. Why are they concerned about that? Well, number one, COVID really highlighted the fragility of some of these international supply chains that Iceland relies on. But the other issue is they are very um, focused on reducing their carbon footprint. They're very proud of their um, um, green energy, but they have really, been aggressive about pursuing um, reductions in carbon um, and greenhouse gases. And so increasing domestic vegetable production is one attempt to also uh, focus on their, uh, achieving their climate change goals. The other thing that they do to capitalize on resources is, of course, as you saw, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And people have discovered that beauty. 
Now, you have to think about this. Iceland was, you know, the poorest of European countries in the early 20th century. And really, they just, you know, they were living pretty isolated lives on farms. There was a lot of immigration to Canada and places like that. But by the latter half of the 20th century, they've really catapulted into a um, very modern, tech-heavy um, lifestyle. Um, that's also allowed them to attract a lot of tourism. And this uh, tourist boom has really been produced in the last 10 to 15 years. Well, agritourism is also catering to these tourists and it's provided some opportunities for farmers around the country. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, they have everything from the geothermal activity. These are mud pots um, up in um, Northeastern Iceland. And then this is the, the bottom shot is some sheep grazing in the national park. The sheep weren't supposed to be there, but they were. Um, consumers are also very environmentally aware in Iceland. Um, uh, there's a lot of interest in environmentally produced foods, but they're not always thinking that Icelandic farmers are doing that because they, they see sheep and they're like, oh, sheep are terrible, sheep damage the environment. Um, so they have some work they have to do to uh, um, really work with consumers and help them understand things. So I want to talk about three different kinds of examples that I think are really important to show how they capitalize on these resources and adapt. Um, the first I want to talk about is a dairy called Epstadter. Um, it really is thinking about adding value to its milk production by turning to, 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 to traditions and customs. Sorry, I couldn't get that out. They produce skir. Now, skir is... Um, what we look at as Icelandic skir, if you've ever seen it in the, in the grocery stores, it's, uh, it looks like Greek yogurt. Um, that's not the traditional method of producing skir. It's more of a fresh cheese, more of a soft fresh cheese. They sometimes mix it with milk um, and make it more yogurty. Um, but skir was part of what they call the settlement diet. So the, when the Vikings came in the late 800s, um, you know, things didn't change very much from the, the in terms of the dietary habits for a, for a long time. Um, it's very high protein and it's very, it's made from whey, so it's quite good for you. This particular, this is a, one of their daughters here who um, is also participating in the um, um, business. Uh, one of their kids is married and to a farmer nearby, so they're, they're keeping the population. Um, going in this in this rural hamlet. They sell cheeses, ice cream, and other products that they can make from these milk byproducts. Um, this includes um, the uh, this drink called whey, um, uh, or uh, it's made from whey, I should say, and with Icelandic um, wild berries and herbs. Um, it's an interest, it's an okay drink. Um, it's a little sour, but it's uh, it's very interesting. But the other thing that I found fascinating about the way they set up their shop is that they were really focused on educating. So they have educational exhibits that they've worked with an artist to create original drawings. So it's like an art project, artwork, like a gallery in their actual um, shop, on-farm shop. And they do this because the government really encourages trying to get tourists off all of the you know, um, well-traversed natural amenities and into um, smaller museums, into smaller spaces where they can handle some of the, the tourism maybe a little bit better. And so the government actually supports this kind of networking that I, I found really, really interesting and I think, think really useful. For them now, they also do things like um, you know, there's it's very transparent. So back behind here is where the the shop is, and there's uh, windows into the actual cow barn. That's Anner, the um, farmer there, uh, very innovative guy, talking about um, how he applies that um, in the uh, uh, his daily operation. They have a petting zoo, they have a playground for the kids. So there's a lot of things that they do in terms of education that is oriented both towards tourists and Icelanders. So they get a lot of Icelanders that come up from um, the capital region for uh, um, 
uh, summer trips and so on. Their busy season is May 15th through about September. And then they, I think they divert milk the rest of the year sometimes to the, the standard milk marketing channels. Um, another farm that was very close to where I, I was living is um, Hafet uh, Goat Farm. Um, goats also came to Iceland with settlement and um, they ebbed and flowed the population of goats, but by the late 90s, they were really, really down in population. She only found three hornless goats left, only two brown ones. Johanna was very concerned about this and wanted to save the, these genetics and these animals. Um, so she uh, took them into, she started working in her parents' farm and she took the, on these goats um, for, because she wanted to preserve genetics but she didn't find very much state support for goat production. So she turned to, well, let's get education going, let's get products out there. So she does a lot of on-farm education. Some of the goats are, are very um, uh, tame and you can um, pat them and they'll be up there with you. This is actually, Etta is uh, one of my students that took my class in Iceland. Um, so they do a lot of education, but then they also have these really incredible products that really build on their heritage. So they use traditional herbs like birch bark, Icelandic thyme, some of the other things that I can't remember all the things that were here, but all of those cheeses were absolutely fabulous. Um, and, you know, some of their goats were uh, used in uh, Game of Thrones um, as well. And so this is also a place that's oriented both to tourists and to Icelanders. When I ask how COVID's gonna impact them, they're like, well, it'll be down a little bit, but I think we'll be okay. Um, they, uh, another thing about this is they use the Nether Farm's infrastructure to make ice cream. Um, that farm is located in North Iceland near Akureyri, which is the second largest city. Their ice cream parlor is right over their cow barn. Okay, so you walk by the entrance to the cow barn, you go back up, you get your ice cream, you go out and you're, um, sit, you, you sit at picnic tables where the chickens are just around you. Um, but it's a, it's a farm experience and, and, and people really value it. The last thing I'll talk about before I run out of time here is um, a Nordic style of direct marketing. Um, Reiko actually started, I believe from the literature, it started in Sweden, um, but it's rapidly spread through the Nordic region. And what it does is it's a way to directly connect using Facebook. And Facebook in Iceland is about 95% of the population is on Facebook. Um, it's used in a different way, primarily to show, um, you know, share news about your family, but also then um, for events and things like that. Uh, so what happens is they set up, um, they have something they call Reiko Vesperlands, that's a, web, uh, a Facebook page that's for West Iceland. Then they set up events. Okay, in Borgenes on June 10th, we're coming to Lioma Lynn um, and you know, order stuff and then uh, uh, you'll be ready to pick it up there. So the farmers then just post in that Facebook event, they post what they um, are gonna be bringing and people reply to them and say, oh, well, I want this much trout and so on. Um, so it's not like a CSA because it's just a one-off. So like you can just go to this one June 10th one or you can go to different ones, but it's an attempt to connect them because there's really not that many traditional or not what we would call farmer's markets there. So finally, um, just to wrap up, I think that insights that I, key insights that I have are um, Icelanders, you know, they have this idea, we got a plan so we're gonna plan, but we're gonna adapt because we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, you can see that with the COVID response, they um, um, had a plan that they, they put into action immediately. They had a plan for the pandemic, um, but they adapted it because they had to. Um, they build on the resources that are available. So like hot springs have been known since settlement. Um, this is a Viking pool where they were uh, um, baptized yet they didn't really do geothermal until the 20th century but then they did it very whole hog in there and it's a very green energy source they combine culture and education to connect with both local icelandic audiences and global audiences and then they have these policies responses that help encourage networking and local knowledge okay i'm going to end there but i'm going to show you some more pictures but as um, um if we have questions um let me know
Excuse me. Thank you, Mary. Um, if you do have a question for Dr. Hendrickson, then please go ahead and include it in the chat screen, or you can also um, send me an email at roacham at missouri.edu. Uh, Mary, we do have a couple of questions that have been submitted. Uh, one is um, getting to the idea that Iceland was close to joining the EU a few years ago, but then didn't. Do you have any idea about what caused that change? Um, I actually don't know for sure, but they're not very happy about EU regulations. So I don't know if that is part of the, the issue. Um, some of these have been, I heard from farmers that the EU regulations were really stifled some of the things that they wanted to do and especially in terms of direct marketing but then and are the dairy farmers like you know i followed the regulations i talked to the regulators i like well you know you say this in the regulations but you know this is what i'm doing and it's the right food safety and he he found it easy to work with um but i think that they were concerned about um the regulatory power they're very independent as well. For instance, in the COVID situation, they have not always been happy with the EU Schengen area bans on who can come into the country or not. Um, so I think that they that also may have played a role in how they view um, EU membership. Great, thanks for that. Uh, another question here is asking about our direct markets or our farms that market directly able to make a full-time living Um, yes and no. Okay. So, uh, the, um, like the goat farm and the dairy that I highlighted here, yes, they are making, um, a full-time living there. Um, but a lot of Icelanders have, especially in the farm community, especially with like the, the sheep farmers and so on, they'll have, um, a spouse who has off farm jobs or they'll do more seasonal jobs. For instance, sheep slaughter. They, sheep slaughter is totally seasonal. So they won't have any slaughter happening until the fall. And in the past, sheep farmers used to go work in the slaughter plants. Um, and then, you know, so the, they would do these kind of seasonal uh, kinds of things. That doesn't happen so much anymore because they have these other, um, you know, job opportunities and so on. So it's a yes and no. So the ones I've highlighted, they've been able to do it. But as one of my students said, yeah, the government always wants to highlight these people who are so innovative doing these things so well. Um, so I think that they find that they would like some more support um, for making farming a little bit more profitable. Okay, so relative to the US, how much of Icelandic farmers sales are direct to consumers? Is it more or less than in the US? Um, I do not believe that the um, um, direct sales are as developed as they are here in the U.S. Um, the, I mean, the vast majority of people that are farming in Iceland are doing sheep farming and then maybe dairy farming and, you know, they're going through traditional channels. Um, but the ones that are oriented, I mean, there are people that do sheep farming, but then they'll have um, a bed and breakfast on their farm and they'll, they, you know, they'll do that. So they're they're not really moving very much of their farm sales to that bed and breakfast, but they're using the, the landscape to kind of um, meet a need. Okay, uh, so what are characteristics of farms that have done best with adopting the RACO strategy of selling via Facebook or, you know, organizing Facebook events and um, getting consumers to come out to those events? You know, that's a good question and I don't think I can answer it very well. The problem for me was that I found out about RACO um, I went to one of the RACO meets in February and then COVID, <laughs> so they, they quit them. And the one thing that they, the, the big event that they were organizing in the capital region also was scheduled for, I think the beginning of March, got rescheduled to the beginning of May. And then they, you know, they still have a limit on gatherings. It's like 500 people now. So, um, so I didn't really see those RACO farmers that much, uh, but I, I do think it's a really, from the literature I've read, like in Sweden, there's a lot of farmers that consider it very successful, but these are people who are very minimalist, who are um, 
maybe more trying to homestead and be really self-sufficient and then using Reiko as a way in Sweden, I should say, from the literature I've read. And I'm not sure if that same thing applies in Iceland or not. Okay, great. Uh, so do rural young people in Iceland tend to stay and return to rural areas or, I mean, how are they attracting this generation of farmers? You know, this is what they're worried about. So they're very uh, worried about this kind of thing. In um, we stayed at a um, on a sheep farm in northeast Iceland, um, and they were talking about the average age of farmers. And you, we could have been in the U.S. talking, right? Um, and they were trying to do some really interesting things at that sheep farm with this, um, you know, bed and breakfast and different things like that. So. Um, one of the rural development strategies, though, is that they are, they try to place a number of jobs, it, government jobs, if they can, out in rural areas and disperse some of the jobs. Um, so, for instance, I was at the Agriculture University, which is an hour from Reykjavik, and they, that's been an agriculture college for a while, but they combined the research part of the government with the Agricultural University and the headquarters are actually in the in the small town, small rural town, and not where the research center was in in uh, Reykjavik. So, uh, you know, they are they are worried about this. They're trying some of these strategies. But one thing I would say, given Missouri's broadband situation, everywhere you go in this sparsely populated place, you can get internet. How do they do that? They build the infrastructure. Okay. Uh, a question here is about um, the barley crop that you had mentioned earlier and how there were three crop failures like in a series of about 10 years. So was that a case of poorly adapted varieties or was it a weather or climate problem or what are some of the other contributing factors? Well, apparently uh, grain production was more widespread during settlement um, than it is uh, after uh, the weather, the climate changed in the uh, Middle Ages or I mean later, later uh, um, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, so apparently it was more fa favorable for grain crops early on. And then um, it became less favorable, especially um, in the um, latter half of the 1800s. So uh, I don't, they are, they are working on barley um, research at the university um, to try to get more adaptive varieties. Uh, we'll see what happens with climate change. Maybe that'll be helpful for them. Um, I'm not an agronomist, so I don't know um, I, some very basic things about barley. Uh, and, you know, there are some crops that respond really well to extended periods of light, and I'm, I don't think barley is one of those. It has to have a, a particular season, but I'm not the agronomist, so I'm not sure. About <laughs> sure. So what types of risk management options are available for farms in those kinds of scenarios? I know that you mentioned there was some government support, but what did that look like? Well, my impression of um, government support for agriculture is that it's very much like what we had, what Europe and the U.S. had in like the 80s and 90s. Um, so it's still direct subsidies and uh, it's very oriented um, to sheep and so on. Uh, so the these new policies, like the, um, I know the rural development officer in West Iceland told me that they were, um, you know, the horticulture people feel like they don't get the government support. So this, this uh, new policy is perhaps uh, an initial step for them. Um, but, you know, like they would like to have more um, support for the lighting, you know, it costs a lot to light these houses, even with cheap energy, it's still, that's a, that's a significant issue for them. That's why more of the uh, greenhouse production is located in South Iceland. They get just a little bit more light and that it's helpful. So, um, but I don't think that they have as many, I don't think that their policy, just from my initial understanding of it is, and you know, I stand to be corrected. I don't think that it's as oriented towards risk management as it is towards more traditional support policies, direct support policies. Okay, great. But they say they're going to do this and they want everybody to be very innovative and they hold up these farmers. I talked about, oh, be more like them. And, uh, uh, but 
that people feel like there's not a lot of oomph behind helping them be more like that. Sure. Great. Well, thank you, Mary. It's time to close today's webinar. We appreciate you sharing about your trip and all the experiences that you had and what you saw. Uh, thank you to our audience, too. When you exit Zoom, you'll see a post-webinar survey. We'll load in your browser. If you could please consider responding, we'll use the results to improve the webinar experience and also brainstorm future webinar topics. You should receive a recording of today's webinar via your email sometime tomorrow. So join us for our next Engaging for Missouri webinar on Wednesday, July 29th. Alan Spell, who is an Assistant Extension Professor of Regional Economic Development, will share a presentation titled Missouri Economy Indicators, an update of key measures as the state reopens. Again, joining us and enjoy your Wednesday. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Alice. It was fun. Yeah.